free events this week. But we started with our Muslim Women's Arts Festival. I think some of you attended that festival. We had Zalina who's sitting here as part of this. She did amazing work. My own team's here. And we have Dawn from Man Whitfield Society is here. So many people did attend and they loved it, they enjoyed it. So this is like a little mini version of a festival today with all this performance. Now, I'm pleased to announce this event is not just ours, Mash Fest. It's a very special event because it's in collaboration with Creative Manchester, with the University of Manchester. A few years back when I set up the festival, I wanted to have as many partnerships as possible and I reached out to the university. And since then, guess what? Every year we've done an event together. And it's been absolutely a marvellous journey. And every year, Anne Marie will agree with me and her team, it gets better and better. Where are you, Anne Marie? There's, there's my. Hi, Cheryl, Greater Manchester, lovely Mary Liz Walker. She's a huge supporter of my friends. Every year she joins in something else and she loves it. She's actually given us her afternoon to come to us. And then after that, we'll introduce another special speaker, Professor Dame Nikki McCullum from the School of Nursing from the University of Manchester. So we're delighted to be presided by two wonderful cheer women to join us. So I think Anne and Professor John is a win-win situation for all of us. Absolutely incredible. Event. So Mary, would you like to come and say a few words? And don't
is what we're all about and, and nowhere more so than healthy futures and creative Manchester. Hence why we've supported this event today. So that's all I wanted to say really, except to emphasise that we are here to learn from you all. Because only by working with you on these main and I mainly do uh, research on people's um, experiences of health and healthcare, and have a particular interest in politics as well as community um, engagement, public involvement in the research that we do in our work at the University of Manchester. Um, so I'm going to hand over first of all. Two and a half weeks ago, I 
she had spinal surgery. I think they were also going to be here, but I made an attempt to come here. And um, I was at Birmingham Old PD Hospital. And all the staff were amazing, absolutely amazing, except one nurse. And um, I, I just couldn't believe it. I was in natural shock, actually. And that half, you know, like the half century I've been on this planet, or even more, and I thought things would be getting better, but they're actually not. I still um, can't believe that I faced uh, racial discrimination still. You know, I just couldn't believe it. I thought, no, it's not possible. For the first few days, I tried to ignore it. But it was so apparent, it became so blatant. Um, and I thought, oh, this is a Additional changes. But that was related to health, education, school, um, caring responsibilities, various parents who had caring responsibilities. Um, and school related concerns or whether that was related to any other aspects of their lives. It didn't always necessarily translate to an impact or change. I can give you three um, examples. One of the consultations that I had started with Sophina, I'll tell you again the points I've raised with other people, but I'm telling you now you'll be back here in 10 years' time asking me the same questions again. This is what's been happening, been happening to us for years. Other times, when I tried to say elderly women who had language barriers and did not speak um, English necessarily, they said, what we say when we go to GPs, as an example, in terms of having a language interpreter, that we do not want somebody who doesn't know us. We want a family member, we want a female family member, so we feel culturally com comfortable to share our African concerns. That's not taken into account. It's not fighting saying these things over and over again because it's not optioned. And they end up in real life scenarios where they continue to have to. This is not from different, who is from a different country, language, culture, societal, um, education, digital inequality. These women are facing not just one challenge as well. We are facing many challenges. And for example, I have, uh, last night I was um, in, a, in a discussion, open discussion with some women, and guest Rajiv was online with us. Um, it was just with health inequalities where a woman has lost five children from miscarriages. And that was three months, five months, six months, seven months. And the latest one she's lost, um, which is about three months ago, the doctor actually said to her that I can only find out what's wrong with you is if you get pregnant again. And losing five children from miscarriage is not easy for her. She's in tears, but the solution that the doctor is giving to her is get pregnant again and then I'll find out what's wrong with you. She has language barrier, she can't explain herself. What's wrong with her? What's going on? Interpreters, like uh, Sweena said, just to do the job, what they want them to understand. I'm not saying they're incompetent, but they are, they're doing the best as they can. In history, I worked in Manchester Heritage for a while, but it took me until the age of 24 to realise after being told that Henna and folk songs that we have and the dancing that we do is heritage. Um, and the only reason I found that out is because I went to a Muslim heritage event in Rochdale by Awakening Minds and that's what they had there. And I was like, what, what, what do you mean this is heritage? She was like, oh yeah, this is history. I was like, no, it's not. It's just, just the thing me and my mum do on like their random Saturday nights. <laughs> Now because of that 
straight for an hour. It's what a beautiful experience this is. This woman in front of me, she is bestowing art that's been around for centuries on my hand right now. We're sharing a personal and beautiful moment. And I think that creativity, they've actually visited to, we actually took them the last year from Edinburgh all the way to London. And every coach was 73 women with children. So this was families going out. Have. They've never been to these places. Never. They, nobody living in here for about 23 years, 25 years, 30 years. The feedback I received is only 30 years now. This is my first time going to London. I've never been to Edinburgh. I've never seen Edinburgh Hospital. So this was a creativity that they wanted to do. And the children, when I see them, they say to me, when are we going again? Because then we can go back to school and tell the stories that we'll leave this somewhere in summertime. Because we never went out. We could never go. Our dad's at work, they do morning shifts, they do night shifts. It's really hard. Nowadays, because of living in crisis, it's really hard to put food on the table. So we created, during COVID, Fusion Food Bank, which was halal and first of its kind in Berwick. The reason I called it Fusion Food Bank was, it wasn't just for Pakistani and Muslim community. And I felt very uh, frustrated in the way that uh, the media was portraying certain ethnic groups in relation to COVID-19 and the statistics that were coming out. And it was in this moment of frustration that I applied uh, in collaboration with my colleagues for a small project. And the idea was that we were going to consult with community groups and members of the community that usually, who usually do not take part in this kind of um, university-based research projects. We wanted to consult with them, so they were collaborators, we didn't want to interview them. And we wanted to really identify their needs, just like everybody has been saying, and we wanted to know, what are your needs and we want to do it from a research angle? And how can we mitigate your needs? What are your suggestions? We want to strategize them on voices and then bring it to policymakers. And of course, we were focusing on schooling related concerns. But the second I sat down with the first uh, member of the project, they very quickly schooled me on the fact that their living experiences of inequality is not just about schooling. They very quickly told me, Sophia, it's not just about schooling. It's about our health experiences, the way we actually engage with health uh, providers and healthcare providers. It's about how we've been portrayed in the media. It's about how the local policies are being derived and have a direct impact on our lives in comparison to other groups and they were differentiated. What do researchers need to do? What do policy makers need to do? What action? What messages do we have? Um, yeah, I'm happy to start first. I think, thank you for your two phenomena that I've found throughout the years. And the first one I would like to get bring awareness to is something called Bigger Syndrome. Now Bigger Syndrome is a term that uh, mental professionals till this day still sometimes use just to um, put everything under um, when it comes to South Asian women. So the thing about having a engage with communities
yeah, 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 yeah,